Father, we thank you in the name of Yeshua for this time to study your word. Not theologically and theoretically, Lord, we're studying it as your manual to help us in the midst of this war, this spiritual war, this conflict. We thank you, Lord, to give us a light uh, from your word today. In Yeshua's name, amen. One of the things and uh, we're going to read, we'll start from reading from Joshua 1. And uh, I want to say that this war has been a turning point, a huge turning point. It struck me this morning, uh, I don't know if you, did you realize, this war started almost exactly to the day, 50 years from the uh, Yom Kippur War, October 73, October uh, 2023. It's interesting, on the Hebrew dates, one, one turned out to be Yom Kippur and the other was Simchat Torah. But on the, in the, in the uh, Loazi, the, the Gregorian calendar, it's basically the same time. 50 years almost to the day of that disastrous war in this one. And this war, in this jubilee change, this is a, what they would call a game changer. But I would say more what we're saying, it's, a, it's forcing a change of concept. Uh, some of us saw an interview in uh, Hebrew with a general, uh, Yossi Bachar, who was the general was, who was responsible for all of the security for the whole uh, Otef Aza, the, the whole settlement area there. And, um, and he just started to cry. And he said, well, he was also crying because his mother was killed. He went out, he's like, he's close to my age, he went out with a rifle and just shot 15, shot 15 terrorists himself alone, you know, and, but, but then he began to weep and he said, not only was he weeping for his mother, but he said, I realized that our whole concept has collapsed because we were hoping that just by being nice and opening up and opening up our, our kibbutzim and inviting them to come in and, and to work with us and give them the jobs and that this was going to work out and he said that that's collapsed. And, he, and he, it just, it wasn't that it was just the war. It was a concept that we'd been living in for, for 50 years had, had, had collapsed. And um, that, that was a huge thing. I want to give a couple other testimonies from, from the war uh, of something because we're recording this in English, particularly things that we see in some of the Hebrew news that wasn't, isn't being translated so we can get to that. But let's jump to the scriptures now. Let's look in Joshua chapter 1 which was a change of concept for Joshua. This is right after, well, right before they're getting ready to cross the Jordan River, and uh, God comes to him and he speaks to him. Uh, it's really an amazing thing. Let's look in Joshua chapter 1, and um, God speaks to him, and uh, Jehovah talks to him. We'll ask who that is in just another moment. Let's pick it up. We can only take part of it. Let's pick it up in verse 5. Verse 5 says, um, Joshua 1, 5, Lo yitzev ish lefanecha kol yimei chayecha. And no man will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. Kasher ha'iti Moshe ehye imach. Lo arpecha velo ezveka. He says, and as I was with Moses, I will be with you. And I will not make you weak and I will not leave you. Well, not an amazing thing to say. He's saying no one will stand against you. Meaning, he didn't mean that no one will come up to stand against you. He meant people will come up to stand against you, but they will not be able to succeed. You can interpret that two ways. It doesn't mean the first one. It means people are going to come and stand against you, but they will not succeed. And then he says to him, as I was with Moses, I will be with you. I mean, he was, he was Moses' assistant. I mean, he was his right-hand man. And for, for 40 years, as he was, I mean, Moses? God opened the Red Sea. I mean, this is, as you with Moses, you will be with him. Now, I want this verses to come alive for us right now. Okay, let the Holy Spirit speak this to you, speak this to me. God's saying to you and me, as that no one will succeed in standing against you. I'm not promising you that people are not going to stand against you, but they will not succeed in overcoming you in the conflict in front of you. I'm talking about you in this room. I'm talking about you who are going to hear this message. You're going to have to stand in conflict, but it will not succeed. And then God said, as I was with Moses, I will be with you. That was a shock for Joshua. But hey, let's take that ourselves. Can you hear that? 
God is saying to you and me, as I was with Moses, I'm with you now. Joshua's in here. Moses is in here. This is it, folks. He's here with us. M Moses had huge authority and power, but that power and authority spiritually has been transferred to us in the name of Yeshua and the power of the Holy Spirit. I mean, of course, on a human level, none of us is even close to Joshua and Moses. These guys were huge figures. But on a spiritual level, we're actually in a better place than they were. They didn't have the name of Yeshua. They didn't have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. So we can be um, humble on a human level, but we need to be bold on a faith level to say we have more authority and more power than even Joshua and Moses had. We got, this was a change of concept for them. Folks, we have to go through a change of concept right now. And he says, I will not leave you, and I'm not going to weaken you. I'm not going to let you be weak, and I'm not going to leave you alone. He's not going to be, okay, God was with me for a while, and now I guess he doesn't want to bless me right now. No, no, he says, that's not going to happen. Let's go on in verse uh, uh, 6. Chazak ve'amatz. Ki ata tanchil et ha'am hazeh et ha'aretz, asher nishbati la'avotam v'telehem. It's a huge verse. Be strong and courageous, for you will give as an inheritance. You will cause this people to inherit the land which I swore to give to their forefathers. The inheritance of the land is one of the biggest subjects of the entire Bible. I've taught upon it many times. I'm not going to go into it. It's 30 seconds just to remind you. you know, God is in the process of taking possession back of planet Earth. The devil stole this planet through him uh, making Adam and Eve submit to him and the rest of the human race through sin, and they took control of this planet. Yeshua is in the process of taking this planet back. He's doing it piece by piece. He wants the whole planet, not a little piece of it. But you got to start somewhere. Where did he decide to start? This little piece of property. And he had one man... And one piece of property, that man was Abraham. He brought him back here and he said, let's start. You, I'll, you will take possession of this little piece of land and your physical descendants will have ownership of this physical piece of land. But your spiritual descendants and all of the rest of the nations of the world, they will have inheritance rights to the rest of the world if they submit to me, if they follow me by faith. God was starting the process of taking possession over the whole earth. We've talked about this again many times before. I've said, other than the name Yeshua, the most important word for you to learn in Hebrew is the word Aretz, which has two meanings. It means the land of Israel, the land of Canaan. It means the planet Earth, the same word. So when you ever read the promises, you can read it one of two ways. It's saying double meaning. I'm giving you this little piece of property, an hour and a half drive from Tel Aviv to Jericho. You can have that piece of property, but it's also referring to planet Earth. He's starting it. And so when you read this verse, you will give as an inheritance to this people. It, this has got to be read on two levels. He said, you're giving this piece of land to the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But by faith, you're starting the process to return planet Earth to the possession of the people that will walk in the faith of Abraham. Wow, this is what it's all about. Think again. He said, because you are going to give this land as an inheritance to this people. Now, we take that mandate. This mandate to take repossession of planet Earth is the foundation of what we call the gospel. The gospel is not for you individually to be forgiven of sins and be, and be jettisoned out of this planet and go live in, an, give, live in somewhere else. Pie in the sky. That's not what it's about. You have to get saved, born again. We submit to the kingdom of God and then his kingdom comes and retakes possession of this planet. And that's what it's all about. Now, think about these words. That all of the academic world and the diplomatic world and the media world is saying that we are occupying this land illegally. We are occupying this land illegally. Do you know what that means? You're denying every single word of scripture. Forget what you think politically. If we have a different political situation, you can't say the Jewish people are illegally occupying this land. That's impossible to say that. Because that denies the very concept of God taking repossession of planet Earth. I personally believe that's the voice of Satan coming up. I'm not going to let you, God, back in this planet. Satan doesn't care about Jews. He doesn't care about Arabs. He doesn't care about Israelis. He doesn't care about Gazans. That's not what it is. It's about blocking 
the, the presence of Yeshua to come back and take possession of this land. And he's saying to him, you take this land. Now, who was the person that was saying, he was saying this to? It was Joshua. Joshua is the same name of Jesus. Sometimes I wonder how we could have read the New Testament if they had translated his name into English as Joshua. How much the association would have been so clear. Jesus came the first time to save us of our individual sins. He's coming the second time as Joshua to take possession of the land. That's what this fight is all about. Now, and he goes on, uh, where are we now? Well, he says, you've got to be strong and you've got to have courage. Why? Because you're going to be facing opposition. You're going to be facing opposition. There's no way from this point, we've had a game changer. From this time on in history, no Jew and no Christian is going to be able to walk in what they believe in without being strong and courageous. Because the whole world is open up. They're all against us now. And we have to stand up and we better be together. And, the, and any Christian country has got to say, and I love this. Let's believe this. Starting to repeat this phrase, Judeo-Christian values. We need to say that in all of the Christian world. We were praying this. Ariel prayed hard. But we also need to pray that for Israel. You see, this can't just be Jewish. If this is just Jewish, we've had it. This is Judeo-Christian. And we're together with our Christian friends the spiritual sons of Abraham are together with us just as well. If not, it's just as much as a suicide as it'd be a Christian world. The Christian, the church without Israel, the Christian world without the Jewish world, it's both, they're both, they're lost. Folks, we can't stand against that. The Christian world is not strong enough to stand against the present conflict, nor is the Jewish world. We have to come in. We have to work together on this. It's forcing us to come together. Hallelujah. All right. Uh, it's gone. He says, okay, and so be very strong and courageous. You must um, uh, observe and to keep and do everything in the Torah that was commanded to you by Moses, my servant. So one of the things is we have to go back, of course, to basing what we believe in on the Word of God. The Word of God. We can't have Believers today that are not studying the word of God every day. I don't care what you feel like. I don't care what you're having an intimate experience. You may think you are. If you're not strong in the word of God, you're not going to be able to stand. I don't want to hear about your intimate, intimate experiences with God if you're not studying the word of God every day. Because I don't know what intimacy you're having. You're just having some kind. Well, I don't want to go there. All right. So we have to be strong in, in, in the word of God. Now, this is the fight that was happening. Now, this for Joshua. Now, Joshua was pretty ready, you know, already. But this was for a change of concept in the Jewish people. They're, they're not, they haven't crossed the Jordan yet. That comes in two chapters later. They're saying they're getting ready. What, what have they been doing? Forty years they've been wandering in the wilderness. Why? Do you remember why they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years? When God took them out of Egypt, he said in chapter 13 of Exodus, I'm going to take you straight into the promised land. You know, eh, two-day walk. You take the promised land, come in. But they weren't ready to fight. They had too much fear. They weren't ready to see their faith come up against warfare, against conflict. And so he said, okay, we're going to have to take a 40-year detour. Why? Because that generation has to go away. Because we have a new concept. And this generation has come out of Egypt. They were saved, baptized, crossed the old judge. <laughs> The, the, uh, the, the Red Sea. So they were saved in our concept, but they weren't ready to go into victory because they weren't ready. They didn't have enough courage to face warfare. You know what I'm saying? I'm talking to us as believers right now. There's a difference between being saved and coming out of sin and servitude and, and, and crossing the line where you can go in to take the victory and take the promises. In a certain sense, that 40 years could be compared to 2,000 years of Jewish and Christian history. All right. But that time's over, folks, now. We're, we're, this is, we're at a Joshua moment right now. We're at a Joshua one moment. It's time. We don't have any more time. I'm sorry. Ready or not, we've come to the end of 50 years from the Yom Kippur War, the end of 2,000 years of exile, the end of 2,000 years of the gospel going around. Uh, this, it's, it, it's, this is the time. We've hit this confrontation right now. And the change of concept is that we have to be able to deal with the fact that we're facing war, just like the Allies have to, had to deal with, we love the Germans, but we're going to have to fight the Nazis and destroy them so that Germany can be freed as a nation. Now, this is a change of concept to us. 
The Bible goes on to say in the book of Judges that after, after the generation of, of Joshua and the elders that followed after him, that whole generation died out, they hit the same situation. They came up and, and the angel of the Lord came to them and said, you know, you've stopped following me again because you're not ready to have war. So, you know, I'm gonna, here's my blessing to you. Here's my blessing to you. I'm going to bring all these armies here to attack you. And I'm going to make you stand up. Because if you don't learn how to fight, if you don't learn how to deal with war, you cannot walk in faith with me. It's only half of it. You have to be able to have courage and fight evil. If you believe good, you have to fight evil. There's no such thing as being for good if you're not willing to fight evil. And this is where we've been. Let's just be good. Let's just love everybody. If you love, if you love, then you have to come against the things that hate. If you want to be good, you have to come the things that come against the things that are evil. This is a situation that we're being forced with. The church is being forced with. Israel's being forced with. Nobody was ready for this. This is a change of concept. This is a game changer. What's happening? Are you hearing what I'm saying? This is not just a war. This, we're changing d dispensations here. This is a huge thing to happen. But what it means in a positive way is at that same time, God is saying something to Joshua. So he's saying something to all of us. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to send you into war without the tools, without the power, without the authority. Just open your heart right now. There's an anointing to come now that the Christian world is attaching to its Jewish roots. And now that the, the Jewish world, after all this time, this, that old generation has passed away. This is a new generation. They're coming. God is giving to the Jewish people right now, the spirit of victory and of war and to fight and to win. And that spirit is open to any Christian, any follower of Jesus in, who wants to attach to our people and receive the same inheritance. And I just pray for it to go out, to go out, to go out, to go out, to go out around the world. I pray for every born again, spirit filled Christian to receive the anointing of Joshua, of authority and power and the ability to fight evil and to walk in that anointing. I want every one of us to be like David. They can come up against Goliath and knock them down. Hallelujah. And we want to be like Joshua. We've got to be the generation. God wants to take this, take this, uh, um, this planet back. And we're engaging in the war. And we don't, we don't like war. But God's not afraid of war because he's all powerful. And this is not a time to be going, woe is me. All of the people here is that they're broken. They're hurting. They're crying on the inside. They're saying we have to put that aside because we have a job to do. We have a job to do. We have to focus. We have to come and we've got to win this war because then we can go back to our families and then we can give freedom. And what's happening, it's amazing. You're hearing also the language in our people saying, we're not here just to fight for our, our homes and our families. There's that. But we're saying we understand that we're fighting an existential war of light against darkness of good against evil, and we're fighting on behalf of the nations. Amazing. We're fighting on behalf of the nations that are even complaining against us. They don't realize that we're fighting their battle for them. What an amazing, that's in our soldiers right now. I'd have to say, okay, maybe I'm a little prejudiced. I've got a son in the, I've got a son in Gaza right now. You know, <laughs> we have a son in Gaza. We all, we have a husband in Gaza. We're all there. I mean, all our family, all our, the, all available men in our, in our families are all in this war. So maybe we're a little prejudiced, but not too much. You know, I've heard, I, I, I have to say from a spiritual point, I'm so proud of the Israeli army. How they speak. There's, you don't, they're just, they're professional. They said, we have a job to do. We have to do it. Nobody wants this, but we've got to finish the job. And, and you don't hear any vengeance. And they're all there saying, uh, we have to take vengeance against the forces of evil. But we're, we want to separate everyone that is not guilty. Everyone that's chafmi pesha. What is that? Innocent person that would come in that. I was even thinking what happened uh, the, these last two nights. That the army, our army reached Shefa. Uh, what they call Shifa, which is, I understand, is Shefa. In Arabic, but it's, 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 uh, and they got to that, and it was, huh? What did I say? Didn't say it's a hospital. hospital. Shefa Hospital. The biggest hospital, which is where the, the main headquarters of, of uh, Hamas was. Military, this was in, an impossible situation. They did, they took three works, three weeks, telling the people to get out, giving them a, a way to get out, walking, talking, 
talk, the, the head officers talking to the head of the of the hospital, saying, "Listen, what do you need? Bringing bringing medical equipment in before they attack to go in there, talking to the heads of the hospital, claiming that as as far as I can understand, in two nights of warfare, they got into the hospital area. As far as I can understand, at least at this point, not one soul, not one doctor, not one nurse." Not one patient was injured during this time with it. And not one Israeli soldier was killed. And they went in and, go, and going into the openings of the tunnels there and finding out and, and, and kill, starting to kill the terrorists were there. What? God, God, that's a miracle. This was an impossible situation. This area around Gaza City was the most fortified, um, uh, militarized, armed, armed area in the history of the world. There's never been a place like this. This was the do most demonic, militarized fortress in the world, above the ground, beneath the ground, everything. And our armies come in step by step, step by step by step, doing everything they can to bring humanitarian aid, to protect innocent people, and finding out just the terrorists and going in and going in. Some of them are having to go into the tunnels to try to fight this. It's unbelievable courage, unbelievable pr professionality, unbelievable soldiering, and keeping a heart of not wanting to hurt innocent people. I'm, I'm so proud of that. I think that's the spirit of Jesus in our soldiers, whether they know it or not, whether they know it or not. And to see them going out and, and you know, taking on the morning before the battle and bringing Torah scrolls and opening up and reading the Torah, reading from the Torah and then closing up before they go into the, the battle. I mean, for those of us who believe in the word of God, this is amazing. Now, I want to, make a well let's just do one more point here i want to ask you who was who was talking to joshua he said somebody came to him and talked to me who said this to him who said i will be with you who said that to him huh the same the person in, in chapter five let's look at it real quick we've taught on this so many times so let's just look at it for one second who was it that said in in chapter one i will be with you he just talked to him he didn't see him he didn't appear to him he just talked, he heard him he heard the voice Okay, chapter five, we know it comes up, and uh, in verse 13, somebody appears to him. Chapter five, verse 13 of Joshua, Vahib, and Biota, Yoshua, Yericho, Isai, Navaiha, Vihine, Ish, Omer, Lenegdo, Vecharbo, Shlufa, Biado, Vilek, Yoshua, Elav, Vayomelo, Halanuata, Vim, Litsareno, Vayomelo, Ki, Ani, Sart, Sava, Adonai, Akta, Vati, Vipo, Yoshua, Panav, Artsav, Ishtahu says, and at that, uh, verse 13, and when Joshua was at Jericho, this was after they crossed the, the Jordan now, and he lifted up his eyes and he saw in front of him a man, a man, <laughs> standing in front of him with his sword stretched out in front of him. And, and Joshua went to him. Joshua was pretty brave, huh? He said, are you, for, are you for us or for our enemies? And he said to him, no, but I have come now as the prince, the, the, the commander, of the army of Jehovah, I have now come to you. And he fell on his face and worshipped him. Now it seemed to me, how did he know immediately he fell on his face and worshipped him? He recognized the voice. He saw the guy with his sword standing. He didn't know who it was because he had never seen him. Well, he'd seen him before in a glorified form in the desert with Moses. He'd never seen him in a human form. Are you with me? I've taught him this lots of times, so I'm going fast with this. So he'd never seen him in this form. So he looks at him, he says, okay, you, know, you, you, you want to fight? Are you for us against? He says, he says, no, it's me. He just heard his voice, the same guy that talked to him in chapter one. He goes, oh, it's you. He falls down. And he says, and he says this, he says, now, uh, it's not, you know, I'm not, it's not whether I'm for you or for, whether I'm for you or for the enemies. The question, are you on my side? I'm coming. I'm the, the commander of the chief of the army. And now we've heard this taught. That because he said, no, I'm not on your side, no, that, that God is never on anybody's side. And that therefore you can't be for war. You just have to have moral equivalence on every situation. You have to totally be a peacenik in every situation. That's not what this verse is saying. He's saying, I've come to fight. I've come to destroy the nations of Canaan. Do you want to be on my side while I do it? This is not Israel's war. This is Jehovah's war. This is Jesus' war. It's, and the question is, are we going to be on his side? Just being Jewish isn't going to help. I mean, I'm afraid the majority of the Jewish people in the United States are fighting on the wrong side, I'm talking about my family. God, I hope not. Hallelujah. I'm saying this is a war. He's saying, look, I've come to fight. He's not saying, I haven't come to fight. I'm not on anybody's side. That's not what he's saying. 
He said, I've come to kill these nations of Canaan who are in opposition to me. Do you want to be on my side or do you want me to kill you too while I'm killing them? This was an incredibly belligerent. You know what the word belligerent means? Bele is war, jera is make. Belligerent is to make war. This is a belligerent uh, uh, statement by him. This is not a, a, a neutral, a pacifist statement. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Now, he came, so he comes with that, and Joshua, so, so Joshua fights with him. Here's an interesting thing which you don't see in the translations, is the word sar. The word sar in Hebrew means prince, high leader, high officer. It's what we call a cabinet member today. Uh, a, uh, a male cabinet member is a sar. A female cabinet, cabinet member is a sara. Okay? Now, that's why Sarai's name, Abraham's husband, was her, her wife, was changed from Sarai to Sarah because he wanted to say she's going to be a prince. She's going to be uh, a, a queen. There's really not that much difference between Nisicha, Malka, and Sarah. She's going to be a high level with that. That was why he changed her name, to see that. Now, uh, yeah, that's where we get the name Sarah. <laughs> For, but we have, but so it means a high official. Now, what you don't see here is in this passage in Hebrew, it says, I have come as the Sar of the armies of the Lord. He said, I've come as the commander. The word Sar, at least in its male form, can be commander. I've come as the commander in the chief of the army. Now, that word is the same word in Isaiah chapter 9 when he said he is Aviad Sar Shalom. He is the prince of peace. So the word Sar, you don't hear it, commander of the armies and the prince of peace. But the word for commander and the word for prince, are you getting what I'm saying? Is the same word. He's the Tsar of the army and he's the Tsar of peace. It's the same guy. He's the prince, commander, leader of the armies of Israel. And he's the prince, commander, and leader over the peace that he will bring. And you can't just know him as the prince of peace. Let's just say, for instance, how many Christians do you think in the world today, if you said, do you know that Jesus is the uh, prince of peace? What percentage? 98%. I mean, you have, that's it. how many know that he's commander of the army of Israel? And, uh, not that many. It's the same word. You can't have him as the Sar, you can't have him as Sar Shalom without being Sar Tzavah. You can't have him as the prince of peace if he's not the prince of the armies. You can't have him as the, 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 the head of peace, the one who's going to lead peace if you don't have him as leading the army. Why? Because you got to fight first before you get to the peace. You can't skip the army and you can't skip the war and get the peace. That doesn't happen. That's what Chamberlain thought. It didn't work. Chamberlain was the English leader in the 1930s that thought he could make a peace treaty with Hitler. It doesn't work. It's not going to work today. It didn't work in our kibbutzim along Aza that wanted to be friends. Now, I wanted to also clarify a couple of things because our war here is spiritual. We're not for this war. It's kind of hard to say this, but I want to, I want to clarify this. We're not for this war. We're not for destroying Gaza. And we believe that God's fighting with the Israeli army right now because we're Jews and not because we're Israelis. It's not for that reason. It's got to be because it's right, because of what God is doing. Jews and Israelis are not always right. Definitely not always right. And when we're not right, God fights against us. The situation 2,000 years ago, when we rejected our own Messiah, God fought against our nation, destroyed our nation, sent us into punishment for 2,000 years. Not that God's always for us. He's for us when he said, are you for me? <laughs> when we submit to him, he's for us. When we don't submit to him, he's, not, he's against us. So that's what this is about. We're not for it. And we're not against them because they're Arabs. This is not Jews against Arabs. We love Arabs. We are born again believers in Yeshua. You got that point? Let me make sure you got that point. <laughs> I brought a little uh, visual for us. What does it say? Free Palestine from Hamas. All right. Now I'm going to put this on just to make the point. We are not against Arabs. We're not against Gaza. We are for Arabs. We're for Gaza. Can I get that straight? All right. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's going to mess up the microphone. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, 
I just want to clarify a couple of terms here. Okay, Arabs are an ethnic group. The ethnic group of the Arabs are the closest ethnic group to the Jewish people. They are our cousins ethnically. There is no, we love all peoples just the same, but if there is another people group that we love more than any other people group, it's the Arabs. If you're born again, no, people that are not born again don't feel that. But those of us who are born again, Jewish believers here in Israel, we love our Arab neighbors. We love them more. We love everybody, but we love them particularly. So we're not against Arabs. We love them. Secondly, um, in the different land formations that there are, they, whether it's Gaza or Jordan or so, those are just areas. Gaza is the area south of Eshkelon before you get to, the, get to Egypt. It's a beach area there, which we <laughs> pulled out of in the hopes that they would use, turn that into the uh, Mediterranean Riviera. Incredible that they didn't. You know? We love the Gazans, we love the Jordanians, we love the Lebanon, we love the Syrians, we love the Egyptians, we love everybody. Not just Arabs in general, we love every nation group. We love them. Because we love them, we want to see them come to know the Lord. We want to see them to be eternally brothers and sisters with us in the kingdom of God. Now we as believers, Jewish, Israeli, believers in Yeshua, we need to remember that because not all of our people are that way. Some of the people fighting in the war have this correct heart. Some of them don't. Some of them are racist. But, that, that, but that's not us. We have to fight the same war right now because that's the situation we're in. But we have a different heart. Now, I use the example of David and Joab. Joab was just a fighter. He didn't have the right heart. He was a killer. David was a great military leader, but he had a heart for the Lord. And he said of Joab, he said, you know what? You're against me, but I can't fight the war without you. You know, and it's, it's, and you're too strong for me. But that's the situation. We're not of the heart of Joab. We recognize that some of the people fighting here, will, will, we have to fight together with them right now. But that's not where our heart is at. Our heart is the heart of David. That if we can make peace, if we can make unity, we would rather do that. We fight when we have to fight. That's not the same thing. There will be a division of that. Now, among the, the Arabs in the world, of course, the majority are, are Muslims at this point in time. I want to mention also where we talked about occupying the land. I mentioned this before. I just want to remind you of these numbers. 1, 22, 49. 1, 22, 49. I hope when you hear those numbers in the future, you'll remember what exactly it is. 1, 22, 49. Going backwards, there are 49 Muslim nations surrounding Israel. Of those 49, the minority of them, 22 of them, are Arab Muslim nations. And in the midst of them is one, the nation of Israel. And uh, so that's, so we talk about occupying. Occupying what? Occupying what? <laughs> what are you talking about? You know? Now, in the name Palestinian, I know not everybody's going to agree with me in this. Uh, the, the name Palestinian uh, raises up some difficult questions because the Palestinian, it's not clear, are you talking about an ethnic group? Are you talking about a land area? Are you talking about a political agenda? And when it means those different things, it could cause people to be confused. That's why when I say it, I always want to clarify that. Are, what are you talking about? Are you talking about the Arab peoples living in this area? Are you talking about a political agenda to, to uh, take all this, this land back and throw the Jews into the sea? You have to make the distinction between it. Now, among those Arabs in the, in, in the world, um, in the Middle East here, that all of the countries, the Arab countries, have now become Muslim countries. They weren't always. There was a Christian one, which was Lebanon. Then Lebanon was taken over by a fascist, ISIS, Islamic extremist group called Hezbollah. And they've ruined their country. Syria was never exactly a Christian country, but the Christians had freedom in it until the whole ISIS came in and went, now they've ruined their country. That had nothing to do with Israel. And, and so in these, but Lebanon was a Christian country, at least nominally, uh, culturally, governmentally, until the terrorists came in and, and they fought them. And they, so a lot of the Lebanese people, eh, they don't want Hamas. You know what? They don't, I'm saying, they don't want Hezbollah. That was taking over their countries. Now, among the Muslims uh, in that world, well, let's go back to that. Among the Muslims, among the Arabs, there are a lot who are Christians. The majority of the Christians in the Arab world are, I would say, nominal Christians, of Coptic background and so on. But of those Christians, there was a certain minority 
which are true believers. There's a tendency for them to call themselves believers or Messichim, like we, like we tend to call ourselves Messianics. They call themselves Messichim. So there are nominal Christian Arabs, which are a minority in the Arab Muslim world. And among the Arab Christian world, there's a minority who are real believers like we are, born again and spirit-filled, like our dear sister here, and like all the brothers and sisters that we work with around the world. Now, I'll come back to them in a moment. In the Muslim world, um, there is, of course, the division between the Shiites and the Sunnis, which is not relevant for this. Among the uh, Muslim world today, there seems to be a, a division between those who are calling themselves more moderate and those who are going for the jihadist agenda, which is the jihadist agenda would be the Houthis in Yemen, it would be Hamas, it would be Islamic Jihad, it would be ISIS, it would be Hezbollah, it would be the Ayatollahs, and so those are one. Now, there's a division in the Islamic world as to which side you support. There's a different question as to whether that's coming from the same root in any, in any case. That's a theological question, whether the roots of even moderate Islam are pagan in any sense, and it's that even the moderate Islam is, but it's not acceptable. But that's not, our, that's not our moral conflict right now. That's a spiritual question. That's what has to do with the gospel, preaching the good news, teaching the Bible. But we don't go to war to somebody because they don't believe what you believe in. But what we're talking about now is in the, in the Muslim world, there are those who are going on to a jihadist uh, agenda and those who don't. The people that are most threatened by the jihadist agenda are the other moderate Muslims. They're the first ones that are going to get attacked. And that's why in the, in the Muslim world today, most of them actually, except, except for uh, Iran, which of course isn't even Muslim, most of them are not even uh, Arab, but, but most of the world, they don't want that. They don't want that. Now, they can't, for po their own political correctness, come out and say they support Israel. But I'll tell you something. They're not for Hamas. They're not for Hezbollah. They're not for any of those. Saudi Arabia hates the Ayatollahs in Iran. They, Iran, they bombed their, they bombed their main uh, oil uh, uh, port uh, two years ago. So they, and they don't want that. And that's why they've been all been making sort of statements against Israel. But, you know, and okay, they're not really, they're not coming out to fight against us. It's amazing. This is cause, this war is highlighting, even among the Muslim world, where do you stand? I believe you can be a moral Muslim. Sure you can. I believe, I believe you've got the wrong religion, but you can be a moral Muslim. And this, it's funny. And they are, that, they are to be their worst enemies. They don't want them. Israel has never killed Palestinians on purpose. Egypt has and Jordan has. Not us. Now, with all that having said, so there's, that's part of this war that's going on. Muslims are having to choose. And there's lies going on. And the truth is coming out among the Muslim world right now. Now, the other thing I wanted to say here, see, we're running out of time, but I want to say that, that among the, the, the Arab world are the, is the Christian minority, and among that Christian minority, there's an un, another minority that are true believers. Those, they are our best friends. And we need to pray to strengthen them. We do that every day. Our first prayers for everything having to do with this war is the first thing to pray for the true Arab believing community. And we need them to be strengthened. Think about for these past over a thousand years, they've lived in subjection and fear of Islam, not against fear of us. You know, we didn't have any, we didn't have any power, but, and that, that has hurt them, hurt their faith. And they're trying to figure out how to stand up as, as, as the angel of the Lord said to Joshua, be courageous, come forth. We need you. Now the world needs the true believing Arab Christian community. It can't just be the Jews and the Israel against Islam. If not, then we've got a, It'll, it'll degenerate into an ethnic situation. But when the, when, the, when the Arab Christians stand up and say, we are loyal Arabs, we are proud of our heritage and our ethnic background, but we are followers of Jesus, and therefore we are for moral principles, we are against uh, Islam spiritually, but we're against um, uh, jihadist Islam on moral purposes, that needs to be fought because they, the, the true Arab Christians are the first, are the most hated target of, of the whole jihadism. And we stand with Israel right now, not for ethnic preference, but because the moral issues and, and because we believe in the values of the Bible. I saw um, some of the best people that are standing up fighting this war militarily and also, in, and also diplomatically and also spiritually 
are Arab Christians. There's one man, I don't know, I, I told you about this. Uh, uh, there's a man, a general, an Israeli general, he's a Tataluf. Uh, his name is uh, Hisham Ibrahim. And uh, he is the head officer over all of the tanks inside of, of Gaza right now. I want you to think about that. The tank, the head tank commander inside Gaza right now that's leading the tanks is an Arab Israeli. I saw an interview with him. The guy is brilliant. Good looking, clean cut, is, knows who he is. I'm Israeli, I'm Arab. I, I, don't, I don't know. They didn't come out in that interview. But I'm, I'm, for this purpose, I'm saying it doesn't matter because it's a moral issue. And he says, we need to fight and we're going to fight to the end. And he said, we will destroy them. But he said it calmly. He said, this is a moral issue. No, I'm saying he wasn't upset. You know, he was saying, this is what we need to do. And I'm doing this for our country, our country, which includes Israel, which includes Jews and includes Arabs. This is the best place for us to be. And, 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 and who can say something against that? That's the type of spiritual warfare we need. And of course, we know uh, other, but anyone can stand up and stand for Israel. When we Jews say that, it sounds okay, we're just being ethnically prideful. When Arab Christians stand up and say that and fight against the, the anti Semitism and fight against Islamic Jihad, no one can doubt their voices. There's no one that can stand up against this. And we are coming together. We all need, all of us as believers, the international Christian world, and almost on the international Christian world, and the believing Arabs and the Messian Jews, we need to take the anointing of David on that little stone and take that Goliath down. Take him down. But there's another figure, and I'll end with this. There's another Goliath figure in the Bible, similar to that. And you find this in the book of Judges, in chapters 4 and 5. And his name was Sisera. Sisera was, a, was an evil figure in, in war against it. And God called Deborah and Barak to go fight the war against him. But they didn't win the war. There was somebody else that won the war. A girl. Her name was Yael. She wasn't Jewish. She was a Hebrew, a, 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 a Kenite. It doesn't say Arab, but to me, the, 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 the idea was that, that, that she's what we would call Arabs today. And she says, come on. Come on put her hand to the stake, drove the stake into his head, and killed the leader. Like David took down Goliath, Yael took down Sisera. I believe that's an image of the, of the Arab Christian community rising up. Maybe particularly Arab Christian women, but hallelujah, they're going to rise up, and nobody's going to say no to them, and they're going to rise up. But we need both the Yael spirit and the David spirit today from the Lord coming to fight this in the right way. Well, let's pray. Father, I just pray right now for us to be clear in our mind, not to be confused, Lord, about what we're fighting, that the lines will be clear here. What's occupation? What's not occupation? What's, what's Arab? What's not Arab? What's Jewish? Lord, what's moral? What's not moral? Father, help us to be clear. And Father, we pray for this war to be won. Yeah. We, for, we pray, and it's not even, it's not even against Hamas. It's against this whole international jihadism it wants to destroy everything, Lord. And we pray, Lord, that, that we, as the Messianic Jewish community in Israel and the Christian Arab community, together with the army of Israel, will begin to fight this war first on the ground and then in diplomacy, but then in the heavenlies, in the battle between the good angels and the bad angels. Father, help us to stand up. This is our time, Lord. I pray for the anointing that was on Joshua, that was on David, that was on uh, uh, Yael, that was on our people in every generation to come upon everyone that names the name of Yeshua. And I pray right now for a revelation in the heart of every Christian to see that Yeshua is the commander in chief of the army of Israel. You cannot read the Bible and read it any other way. Wake up! This is Yeshua. He's the commander. He's not just the prince of peace. He's the commander of the armies of Israel. He is the head of the church. He is the king of Israel. And we have to deal with that paradox. And right now, he's fighting this war together. And that's why we're going to win it, because he, because we are fighting with him. And Father, we thank you for that, that anointing to go out, this revelation to go out, that we are in the beginning process. We're going to pray for this revelation this, for the believing community. 
Your faith is not to get saved and leave this planet and live in heaven. That's not what the Bible is about. And the end times war has started to take repossession of planet Earth. Get in the fight. Get in the battle. Don't have to take up a weapon. But you can pray at least. You can speak the truth. And Father, we pray for this to come out and strengthen our people. And Lord, we pray for the anointing and the wisdom of God for those who are praying, for those who are speaking truth on the information level, and also to those who are fighting the battles, Jews and Arabs on the battlefield, to win this war cleanly, morally, and to give glory to God that will begin the process of freedom for Jews and Arabs throughout the Middle East to come into a beautiful revival. In Yeshua's name, amen. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Yes. Amen, thank you.